Thank you guys for uh, coming out. Very uh, powerful film. I'm so glad uh, I was able to see it in the theater. Anyone who's listening should see it in the theater. This isn't a traditional theater, but uh, it's a pretty good proximity or facsimile, I should say, of a theater. Sound of Hope, Story of Possum Trot. It is out uh, July 4th, and we have the filmmakers here. We have Joshua and Rebecca Weigel here. Put your hands together. And uh, the man that started it all, Bishop Martin. And his uh, beautiful first lady, Donna Martin. So uh, great job. We will start with the origins of this film, but not the beginnings of the story, but the origins of why you wanted to make this film and how long it's been. I think it's been about eight years. Eight years, you start. You, it started with you, so you. Yes, it started with the ladies, just so you know. It's me. <laughs> and it ladies. was first lady who started it all. <laughs> so she started this. Um, and we were honored to tell the story. But it um, started about eight years ago. I was working in Los Angeles as a child welfare advocate. Um, and I was doing pastor, a pastor's event to rally the churches in Los Angeles to care for kids. And I was looking for a powerful speaker. And I came across this story. And I was like, wow, like this is really the way forward. This is what churches need to be doing. So I called up Bishop Martin. First, I emailed him. He called me, he's like, let's go Rebecca, let's change this nation, I wanna to come to Los Angeles. And so we did a pastor's event, started with that uh, back in 2016, and he brought down the house. I mean, literally like preached, and it was like standing ovation, all these churches stepping in to care for kids. And I was like, oh man, this is a powerful story. I mean, look how people are responding. So I went to my husband and said, we need to tell this story and bring it to the world. I was like, it'll never work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Man for you. Man, yeah. <laughs> we need to adopt kids. It'll never work. <laughs> well, it's such a long road. Any story, any movie from conception to, you know, the day it arrives to the theater or the streamer or your phone or wherever you see it, it's, it's all so far-fetched. It's sort of like talking to a seven-year-old boy who goes, one day I'm going to be in the NBA, and you just go, right, <laughs> you know, but we can try. And if you're really good, and we don't give up on you, but it, 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 I've been involved with the process quite a bit myself, and uh, many things don't work. Maybe this one felt like there was some divine inspiration behind it, maybe, maybe a power greater than ours guiding it along. That's church, that's church. <laughs> Come on and give him some praise up in here. Hallelujah. So uh, the story, and obviously if you're listening at home or in your car and you, do, you don't know the story, it's a powerful true story um, about adoption and redemption and churches. And, and there's a kind of a math that I think we should get into, which is, you know, the system always fails, right? I mean, I, I don't think we should have as much faith in the system as we do. It's been... 60 years of failure and we keep waiting for the next person to get elected to change our fortunes and our outcomes and i feel sorry for people who go oh i want to get this person elected so finally i can have some hope um, sadly you're going to have to do it for yourself uh, all you can really hope for from the system is they get out of the way they, they never really do anything except for get in the way and so what we're talking about as it pertains to adoption is getting the churches and the people who go to those churches involved, yes? Oh, say, I'm the only one here who's actually used to speaking into a microphone, <laughs> I realized. Everyone else has it stuffed in their back pocket. Yes. Hold those mics high is uh, what I, what I want to say. And I know it's, it's, it, takes a little, it takes a little practice. But, yeah, so let's talk about that. You spent a ton of time doing this actual work. You were right on the front lines, and I think that was part of why you got so excited about this. Yeah, and, and Bishop and I are a great team. Bishop has spoken all over the nation because this story, really 25 years ago, in the Myopa and in, in the America and the Daily Show, People Magazine, when churches step forward and do what we're called to do, 
the world takes notice and, and people say, who are these people? You know, uh, there's nothing offensive about a church serving vulnerable, pe you know, children. I think people are waiting for churches to step forward and live out their faith the way that they did in Bennett Chapel. And so Bishop's become a, an incredible advocate across the nation and has ignited this movement. So, and but we're there, hoping it a, continues to grow. What you're saying is true. The, the, the system, with as many deeply well-meaning people as there are working there and really, really trying to do what's right for kids, it, there's just, it's a machine that just isn't meant to be a parent. We right. talk about the film, this is not a family, and you've got to realize that. So we've got to, we want to get this into the place where you, you know, it ought to be happening, which is families. And so when people know how many things in our society that break our hearts are started back in the foster system, when you've got kids who experience the foster system, and then that leads to child trafficking. It's one of the, the, the most significant factors in the, you, the child trafficking in America and the homelessness and, and you know, all of the, the, the prison population. I mean, we just go down the line and when your family's broken and you end up in the system, then you go through that and you're, re, you're experiencing all kinds of trauma along the way and it just breaks you down and now you're set up for all kinds of terrible things. So that hit me as a creative. I thought if we can capture the story right, do it really well, get it authentic, really, it's a big, big story, but if we can get this to work, now we're touching all of these other things at the same time. We're going to the roots, going way down deep, and that's, that's what got me excited on a sort of practical level. Well, I was, as I was watching it, I had a, I had a bizarre thought, but it, I may be able to bring this home. Um, not all my bizarre thoughts land, <laughs> but I think I can land this one. Um, <laughs> I think people need to be educated when it comes to adoption. And it's not a conversation, you know, we talk about recycling and the dangers of vaping much more than we talk about something like adoption, you know? Yep, and as you said, all the troubles of life sort of start with the unwanted child and the abused child and the neglected child and then prison and prostitution and drug abuse and violence and homelessness. It all just springs forth from that one genesis of neglected, abused child. So if we could stop that, we could stop building the prisons and the homeless shelters and the rehabs and everything else. And But it needs to come to the zeitgeist. People need to know about it and start a conversation about it. And as I was watching the movie, I remember thinking back to the movie Jaws. Now here's That's the part where I have <laughs> to like bring it home. Think of Jaws. Before, I'm, I'm old, Karen, Jaws. but believe you me, before the movie Jaws came out, nobody talked about sharks. It never came up. Everyone jumped in the ocean. Yes. No one had any thoughts about it. There was not a national dialogue on sharks before Jaws, and then Jaws came out. It was a huge impact, and then everyone started talking about it. And I was kind of hoping that this could be the Jaws of adoption. Let's Good. go. Yeah. Woo. yeah. That's where I get the big bucks. <laughs> uh, I, you know, I, I asked the question many times, why is it that? the church is always the centerpiece of everything that God does. I'm an old Baptist country preacher and filled with the Holy Ghost, but I do recognize the power of God. And one of the things that all of us need to understand that whether you like it or not, you've been adopted. If you are a child of God, you've been adopted. Adoption is nothing new. God started that himself. If you look at Moses, he was an adopted child. Because, I mean, Pharaoh, uh, uh, he, I mean, he raised Moses. So we, 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 put this, we paint this picture of adoption as, ooh, I don't want to touch that. But Jesus touched us. Where would you be without him today? We forget what James 1.27 teaches us. Pure religion is under five, that God excel, that we take care of the willows and the orphanage. And if we don't wake up real soon, we are finna lose another generation of young people. Well, I mean, that's our greatest fight right now is in the young generation. Don't you think that we ought to be tired of seeing our kids being slaughtered, misused, and abused? 
Don't you think it's time that God do something and that God called the church? He didn't call the government. He didn't call the president. He didn't call the Congress, but he called the church. And we are the one that's supposed to stand up and make a difference. And it's time for the church to make some noise about adoption. You can't keep sitting on the problem and talking about the problem, but you're not doing anything. We, we call it sitting on the promises and riding, riding on the problem. You can't do that no more. We gonna have to get this thing in order. Otherwise, God got an indictment against the church because we have not done due benevolent. I could preach that in here today, but I'm gonna go. I'm, I'm gonna hurry. I think First Lady had something to say about a gong. What was that? <laughs> you mean uh, that noise? Noise. The uh, what would we like done if we had the ear of? many of our politicians like you know we have a campaign going on right now presidential campaign and we hear border talk and we hear economy talk and we hear fuel prices and we hear energy independence and we hear ukraine and we hear israel and gaza we never hear anything about the kids and you know many may know this but some may not i work I have a background in this, which is sort of unlikely, but uh, growing up, my father was director of education at a place called Five Acres, and it's essentially an orphanage. Yeah. And it's, it's, in it, it's in Altadena, yeah. California, and uh, it's about five acres, <laughs> last I checked. And, and he was director of education there my, during my childhood. And once in a while, he would bring me and as a young boy, and I would sit in the cottages because they were broken off into sort of den moms and den dads and kids and the kids that could go to school, who could go to public school, and the kids that were so troubled that they could not go to school. They had to get their learning in on campus. They could not be let off of campus because they were destructive or troubled or what have you. And um, I, I went there and I had dinner in the, in the cottage. They had eight or 10 cottages with the, the groups. And so I got a kind of firsthand look at it when I was very young. And then when I got older, I took a job called Loveline, which was a syndicated radio show where me and Dr. Drew would sit there all night and talk to young people and all the problems they had. And there was one theme that was very consistent. All the troubled teens we would talk to, all the ones that got into all the kind of trouble you do not want your teens to get into. It was always broken family, fractured family, abusive family. Like it was, the, the theme was very consistent. And I always just thought to myself, if we could fix this, then we could sort of fix everything else. And uh, I don't want to preach too much, but I'll preach a little here. <laughs> you saying, I don't want to get involved with adoption, or I don't want to get involved with this. Well, you may not want to get involved, but you're going to get involved at some point, because at some point, that person may have an impact on you. That person may be living on the street and homeless and psychotic and stab you or your daughter or your son or your wife, or you may be paying for that person to be incarcerated. You don't just escape that person. They don't just go off into the wilderness never to be seen again. They go on the rolls. They, you either are gonna be financially responsible as a society, or God forbid, something, find that person could be breaking in your home one night. You, you know, you, you mentioned, what if we had the ear of the politician? Well, I have a, I, I, I understand that. But in my perspective, the fighting has to stop before anything else can go on. If they stop fighting and see what they have in the hand, that's, that's the biggest thing right now. Everybody fighting against each other. No togetherness. No. And, and the Bible teaches us how can two walk together except they agree. All of this goes back to the church that God called, that God ordained, that God set up for himself. It is the church responsibility. 
in churches on every corner. And what are we doing about the system? We're preaching the gospel. We're singing praises until his name. But where are we rolling up our sleeves and getting out there in the grind like Jesus did and stirring and shake the bushes? Jesus said, I came to seek and to save that which was lost. It is our responsibility. And for the politician, you're right. They're talking about border. They're talking about this. Come on. But nobody yet saying, what about the children? Only God is asking the church, what about the children? Well, let's talk uh, some nuts and bolts here for a second, then we'll circle back to the children. Uh, it is really monumental to make a film, regardless of the size. Um, it is just a Herculean task, so congratulations for, for pulling it off. Thank you. Um, Thank you. You just, you, you hear the word no a lot before you hear the word, you don't even hear the word yes, you hear maybe. <laughs> but it, it just, you really have to be dogged and you have to believe in, in what you're doing. Um, so the film has been eight years in the making. Uh, the script was done and now you have to get it made, right? And so what was that process like? Yeah, well, you're right. I mean, we made it even harder on ourselves because we knew that this, actually, the stories we're interested in, like, take special care. This story took special care. We knew that. And we would even talk about it with some of the, the main sort of faith-based uh, production companies and, and stuff in town. And there's all this pressure to make it something it's not. And so it, it was even more difficult for us because we needed to get the right people behind this. And th the way to get that story on screen with the power it has in it it has to be brought there with the right team, not just the right filmmakers, but the right financing, people that understand the challenges of telling a story like this. I mean, when you tell people the synopsis, it's not, they don't jump at that. 77 kids, 22 families, it's gonna be great. And it, it's, it's yeah. just, all they hear is money, how you gonna it's, do that? That's not Two hours. sexy. No, 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 no. <laughs> Orphans, it's what? It's kingdom <laughs> sexy. No. And then we're so like, we, we wanna show the trauma, we wanna show how yeah. hard it is, we wanna, hold a little bit of a mirror up to some of the churches and, and they were like, no, 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 no. Yeah, You're all gonna the wrong offend things. your audience, the faith-based audience doesn't wanna see reality and they don't wanna see all the trauma. And they, so it was a, it so was a hard. Really hard, yeah. Joe Knittig is the executive producer. He works we're sort of the core of this together and he, he connected with the story so deeply and knew that this story could change things in the nation and so he went into his Rolodex to some donors who he knew would care about this. And he said, these are the people that we need. They won't need their name mentioned. I mean, they care about this and they're gonna empower you. They're just gonna tell you to go make the movie you've got in your heart to make. And so, I mean, it's music to our ears just because someone wants to green light the movie, but then to know that they're with us in spirit, like they know their part of this is to empower us with whatever it takes. And we had to, deal with some really, really difficult things and pivot and it costs lots of money to keep going the right direction and thank God for them because we could not have done this. We would have a movie, but we wouldn't have what you saw and I don't think it would affect you the way it has. Uh, amazing performances. Um, I, yes, I gotta say, like really world-class oh, performances. Yes. Well, I'm oh, yes. most proud about it. I mean, beyond, beyond impressive. Um, so, in, in great direction, by the way. Thank you, thank you. Uh, and, and wonderfully shot film for people that are listening. I think sometimes people are strong on emotion and conviction and ideas and a little short on execution. And oftentimes the people that are most passionate about a subject are sort of don't possess the skill set to really make something look good, you know. I make documentaries and I see a lot of people's documentaries and there's so much passion in them but they're not skillfully made because it's sort of all passion and at some point you need a history. There is a skill set to direction, to right. lighting, to cinematography, right. to music, sound, sound mixing, editing. Like it, it, you have to be able to make a film. Now, when you get passion and skill, then you end up with something like this. Right. I mean, getting people in their sweet spot. I mean, it, it, honestly, it's a difficult thing in, in Hollywood. It, it, like, 
people are kind of interested in one or two things. But we've found that when people really lock into what they're designed to do, I mean, it's unbelievable. It makes everything easier. Everybody, the results are incredible. And, and that's what we really aimed for, is just trying to get the, the highest level in every area. And there's so many areas you guys aren't even thinking about that you experience here. And uh, I wish they could all be thanked personally, but there's a huge, huge team behind an achievement like this. So to be in theaters July 4th, and do we know how large the release is and w what the parameters of that are? Last we heard, over 2,000 screens. Wow. Yeah, I think 2,200 or 2,300. 2,200 screens, hopefully that's correct. But yeah, July 4th, there's, it opened today pre-release, but July 4th is our major. Yeah, so for those listening, you know, that, that's, that's a big, that's a wide release, you know, boutique, you know, I made a movie, we opened in like six theaters. <laughs> One of them was in my house. <laughs> uh, you know, Mission Impossible 5 is in, you know, 3,000 theaters right. or something, but uh, anytime... You're 2,000 plus. That is a that is a wide release, and and I know Angel Studios, who did Sound of Freedom, um, and I got a chance to go to their facility and hang out with those guys a little bit, and it's it's really nice to see regular folks, the folks who live in what they like to call the flyover states and the Walmart shoppers with their guns and their Bibles, somehow are figuring out a way to rally the troops and really go from some sort of fringy outlier into a real functioning business. And I, I think when people look back at this chapter, in this nation's history, they're gonna see that's what was happening, that people got tired of being, um, Bishop, uh, hold your ears, preached at by Hollywood. <laughs> they weren't saying what you were saying. <laughs> they were saying something completely different, nothing that would ever come out of your mouth, and we all just sort of had to sit back and take it, And but the warm has turned. Like, I feel like a, a, there's been a groundswell of sort of, regular, normal thinking, family-oriented, religious, country-loving people who went, you know what, I w we should start making, let's start making films for that group. And that group is half the country yeah. plus. So it does make sense economically. And I think right. Angel Studios is sort of proving that. Yeah, and I think, you know, I'll just speak to that. Like, a film like this, didn't typically have an outlet for distribution because like you're saying, like it didn't fit into the faith market very well, it didn't fit into the Hollywood. But the way the Angel works, for those of you who don't know, is they have an Angel Guild. So there's like 320,000 people that subscribe to the Angel Guild and they vote on the films. And, and if your film scores high enough, or your torch score is high enough, then you get theatrical distribution and release. And so it really is, you know, average people across America saying this is a type of film that we want to see and our family wants to see and it's taking that decision making out of the hands of Hollywood executives who live sometimes in a bubble and giving it to the people. And it's putting power back into our hands. I think one of the things we've realized over these recent years is how critical it is that we do the stuff. We can't just leave it to government like we talked about earlier. That, and we've, we've got to pull this back into our lives, and especially an issue like this. I mean, it's, it's intuitive. It makes perfect sense. You're talking about taking care of human children. Y you know, it does not make sense to, to leave it to a system or government officials or people who are going to clock out at the end of the day. It just doesn't work. And so it's got to go where it naturally fits, and that's in the lives of other people who care. And there's no other group that I know of that, that has given the mandate to do it. Like, we keep talking about church. It's church people that are like, you have the mandate to do this. Part of your identity, it's who you are. You ought to be like Jesus and do these things. So it's time to step into that and, and stop looking the other way and going, well, that's, someone's taking care of these. We gave up on our responsibility decades ago. We have to bring it back. We have to go, no, it's, it's in our lap. And it's okay, we can all find a place. It doesn't mean everyone has to do the fostering and adopting. But we gotta care, we gotta love, we gotta reach into these kids' lives and pull them out of these situations. It'll change everything. Lady Donna, how many kids did you have, or souls did you have inside of your modest home at, at one point? 
Good question. Are you talking about my home as or my siblings' home? I don't know. You like both? growing no, up both? or are you, no? Yeah, you yeah your, your home. Your Sorry, family. your home. Okay, my home. Six. Six was in my home. Six adopted. Yes. And well, actually, four. Four adopted. Two. Two biological. Right. Yes. And then eight altogether. Yes. How big was the house? Well. Two bedrooms, three bedrooms. No, we, we kept it. And adding people on. bring their kids to your house. Yeah. Yes. Let's talk about that. Yeah, the kids. Help. Actually, it was like, I counted it up once. It's like 20 some kids <laughs> came through my home. And when the other foster parents or adopted parents would have problems with their kids, I would do respite. My husband and I would do respite for them. One girl came and stayed one year. To let the parents who were having difficulty, the foster parents who were having difficulty, try to repair or reset or get some therapy or, you know, what, what have you. We wanted to make very, very sure when we went into this and the Lord called us into this, we knew, I knew within my heart, no matter what happened, we could not let go of those children. So I felt a responsibility, being the one that said yes to God, that if any parent would have any problems, they could bring them to our house. Not only did we nurture the children, we were there for the parents as well. And we wrapped our arms around each other. And again, I want to speak to this, as you said, about the government. It makes me think about the word of God, that's Second Chronicles 7 and 14. If my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, forgive them for their sins, and heal the land. Yes, children are not a machine. Yes, we should not be, and I'm not a political person at all. I'm so blind in that. I just try very, very deeply to live by the word of God. But yes, if we will put that energy, if the political peoples, if our state and city officials and our government will put this, our funds and our prayers and our hands on the children and stop building the prisons and the jails, we need to reform. We need to, we need to not continue to see the, the issue, the, the, reco the, the, you know, the, the recovery of the issue, but let's, let's go before it. Let's be proactive. What? I feel Jesus, yes. I don't know about y'all. I mean, I just, because you can't do this work except Christ be with you. So uh, a psychological question, because okay. I think most people are thinking about themselves and what would bring them pleasure, happiness, although it oftentimes doesn't work out. But I think we're all kind of wired to go, what do I want to do? Where do I want to eat? Where do I want to go? What kind of car could I drive? You know, who could I get to like me? And your life was a service to, to others. I mean, you really had to think about everybody but yourself for very long periods of time. And it's hard to avoid when there are 20 of them in your house. It's hard to binge watch stuff on Netflix and tune it, tune it all out. And then they tell you, but those people are happier. But we never quite trust it because we see the people that are eating brunch at Nobu as being happy, not the people in 1,800 square feet with 20 kids inside their house as happy. But you lived a life before this journey where it was maybe more about you and less about those who you invited into your home. And can you talk about the difference in, in how you felt I want to share, before she answered that question, one of the key factors that you all don't know, but my biological son, um, he was born with mental difficulties. And my wife stayed in labor for 18 and a half hours. And the doctors didn't know she couldn't have a child, more normal birth. So he has 
he came out with brain damage. Now, you, you, you look at, look like to me, a lot of y'all said look like you brought in four extra children and then a whole lot of other people. Look like you was compounding your problems. But one thing I do know, the scripture said, God be for us, who can be against you? I just wanted to address that so you all to know that this wasn't a peaches and cream deal. It wasn't a, a ice cream deal. It was a, it was tough. It was rough. But the Lord was with us. And as long as I know the Lord is with us, we, you can succeed. Now you can address that. Thank you, darling. <laughs> you know what? To be honest with you, growing up into a house with 21 children. My mother had 21 children. This was when, uh, when you were. When I was, I, I can't talk about this story. You were without talking about my upbringing. You were number ten and a half of the twenty-one. <laughs> the middle now my child. my sister, one of my sisters says I'm the fourteenth, but then I say I'm the thirteenth. Oh wow! You know, so I don't know how they got that confused. <laughs> anywho, <laughs> anywho, but when you're raised into a home like that with. Um, so many siblings, and you're poorer than Lazarus, and you expect what happens on the outside, which is the weather or whatever. If it's hot on the outside, it's hot on the inside. If it's raining on the outside, then it rains on the inside. But you have each other. You have love. You not you don't grow up thinking about yourself. All you know is to share and to give. So when this handsome, black, dark, tall man from Houston, Texas came and asked my hand in marriage, I said, he looked like he got a job and he gonna work and he gonna make it all good. <laughs> he gonna make me a better life. You know, and, and we had a beautiful life. He had been spoiled. He almost had the first four years of our marriage treated me like a doll. It's like, you take that doll and you set her up on the shelf and she's just beautiful and then I'll take her down and then I'll just polish her up a little bit, put her back up. But I grew into myself because of my raising and then the love and the protection that he gave to me. And then we had our first son and then we had our second. Fast forward in 96 when my mother passed away. You know, after a month or two, reality set in, and I'm crying out to the Lord every day. God, just heal me or let me die. You know, I'm, I'm complaining to him. I'm saying, no child should lose a mother. I'm 36 years old. I'm married, have two beautiful children and a nice dog, sitting up in a pretty decent home that's on the hill, and I remember when we got ready to buy that home, you know, we was looking at it, we looked for a year, and my husband told me, here we go again. Donna, you'll never get that house, not that house. I said, yes, sir, we're gonna get that house right there on the hill. And we living in that house on the hill. <laughs> Y'all can clap, it's okay. <laughs> I'm just telling you about Jesus. Um, what about the next project, uh, because uh, I know when you are in the business you guys are in, you have to sort of plant a crop that may not right, yield yes. any fruit for a couple of years, but you gotta get it into the ground and fertilize early, and then you can get back to the harvest of the crop you planted two years before that, and that's basically the business we're in. Is it? all gonna be a new theme around, and I shouldn't say theme, but you know, um, faith-based uh, stories, uh, redemption and Americana, or, or are we going off to Fast and Furious 11? <laughs> <laughs> Comic book movies. No, I don't, I mean, we, we left a project that was kind of like our heart and soul to do this one. Um, it was based on a short film that went viral called The Butterfly Circus, and we, developed a screenplay for it and had amazing opportunities developing in the business and they just were all just not quite right in a significant way. And uh, so had, had real close calls, this swept us away. We really just felt compelled to do this one. But that one is uh, 
ready to go and we feel really, really good about it. It's been, it's gotten like 100 million views around the world. It's being used all over the education system in America and even beyond. So there's a ton of exposure and it's, it's a depression era circus movie. And it's mm. about a, a guy without arms and legs. Uh, his name is Nick Vujicic actually, uh, who played the lead. And his character flees the sideshow world to join up with a circus that's like Cirque du Soleil. And they mm -hmm. travel around the United States. Uh, so real thematically similar, a lot of, like we, we always wanna do things that matter, that change things, that uh, are beautiful. And you know, in terms of cinema, you know, want you to have an incredible experience if possible, um, but always pack it with as much meaning and, and uh, all of those kinds of things as possible. And it's really crossed over into like the general market, faith market, like it's got a really broad and diverse audience. So yeah, we're really we're not excited very, about it. Like, we're not really in the, we don't fit real well in the faith-based genre. I mean, I love them. I, I, I don't mean to say that like it's, it's a bad thing, but we're, we're, we create differently. And I think you'll see that in this movie. It's, um, it's just different. You know, we, we really want things to be authentic and real and grounded and all the arts to be elevated. You know, we don't want to do anything halfway. It's like, it's got to be great. But we also want to be real. We want to deal with real, relevant things, not just famous people and famous stories. We want to we want to go and address the things that are on the hearts and minds of people right now, that are on God's heart and mind. Um, very spiritual, very powerful. Uh, we follow Jesus, but I'm not into the that genre so much. No, I I I get it. It's sort of like what I said. Um, like there's not a lot of funny right-wing comics. It's just <laughs> something from the left, and I, it's, it saddens me. Maybe I'm the only one. I don't know. Modesty prevents me from even wondering out loud. But the best, yeah, you, like I said, you want people that are really skilled in the arts then moving their way over, not you know deeply re religious, or we're just gonna get another Kirk Cameron movie. God bless him, but I just mean, you know what I'm saying. I, what you want, I'll tell you the best rock, I'll tell you the best rock and roll musicians ever are the ones that are classically trained and then get into rock and roll, or the ones who are fantastic jazz musicians and then turn their sights toward rock and roll. Those are the best players. And that's kind of what we're talking about here, a training, a base, in cinema and arts and film and whatever, and then moving over so true, yeah. into this other realm. And that's where you see the quality come through. It doesn't look like, oh, they had their hearts in the right place, right. but you could tell it was kind of slapped together, you know. The, the, the last question I have, and it's not really answerable, but I, I, it is something I think about a lot. When are the critics going to sort of come over and start to appreciate what folks like yourselves are doing, you know? Because critics are the most progressive, liberal, left-wing idiots in the world. And all they do is, even if something has the whiff of religion, they will take a crap on it. They hate all of this stuff. But at a certain point, they're gonna have to admit these are great stories, right. the acting is superb, the cinematography, the story and the writing. Like, they're gonna have to start giving the, the angel their due. Yeah. They See what I did us, there? I twisted that one. They gotta take us more seriously is why. Yes, and so first they're kind of dismissive, and then it's like, oh, religious, oh, I hate religion, and then they just start crapping on it. But at a certain point, they are gonna have to kind of recognize the work that's being done, and, and I, I think we're inching toward that world, and I hope, you know, I'm looking at the movie, and I'm looking at these performances, and I'm going, wow, there's an Academy Award here. Yes. There's an Academy Award Amazing. there. Yes. And then I thought, oh, yes. but no, because the Academy's never gonna recognize this, yeah. you know, or at least in the past, in the past, they would not recognize it because of the, because of the per, of the studio that put it on because of the religious nature of it they would just turn their nose up at it but at some point it's going to be undeniable 
I think we're there right now. You think now. we're there? I think we're there right now. I mean, you know, it's, it's just amazing when God steps into something. It's undeniable. I don't care. And to answer your question is when they're going to start recognizing it. It's when they see what they see on this film that, uh, uh, you know, we did not give up. People who not giving up. And to follow Christ, you have to first deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow after him. And when you do that, because the race wasn't given to the swift or the strong, but it's given unto the one who's endured to the end. So when you keep on running through that furnace, the fire furnace and, and let let come what may and, and, and still come out, you know, like, hey, I know what I'm doing because I'm following Jesus. Guess what? They're going to come on board because his power, I stand to tell you today. Uh -oh. She's on her Woo! feet. Dance. Woo! Never could have made it if it had not been without him. His power is greater than any power, any force, any body, anything, and I'll tell it worse than ever I go. Woo. Well, I want to say this. We're in, a, we're in a comedy club in Orange County, California. That's definitely the most Jesus has been spoken of on this stage combined, and the club's been here for 11 years. All right, sound of hope. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to put our hands together for this wonderful crew that's on here, and then we're going to bring out the amazing Actors. actors yes. to portray these people in these roles, and we'll do that right after this. Simply Safe. Imagine a burglary. It's a shady character in the dark, right? Well, according to FBI, most break-ins happen in broad daylight during the summer. When homes are unattended. I know. I got pulled over by a cop once. It was patrolling an area. Mornings when everyone left for work, went to school during the day. That's when people broke in. That's why you need Simply Safe. We've always used Simply Safe here. They've been with us for, God, one of our, I think our longest running sponsor. Fast protect monitoring. Mm hmm. Live guard protection. Simply safe agents can act within five seconds and can even see and speak to intruders. The future's here, people. Less than a buck a day. No long term contracts. Cancel anytime. Protect your home this summer with 20% off your new Simply Safe system when you sign up for Fast Protect Monitoring. Just visit Simply Safe. Two eyes in there. SimplySafe.com slash Adam. That's SimplySafe.com slash Adam. There's no safe like Simply Safe. All right, now, uh, ladies and gentlemen, the cast of Sound of Hope. We have Nika King over here, Demetrius Gross, Dana Babnikova as well. Um, you recognize them from the film, all the, all the stars. And a, an amazing performance by, by all, inspiring. Uh, but the one I found most interesting is Nika because she's a stand-up comedian. And I don't think a lot of people could see that necessarily in her performance because you think of something else when you think of stand-up. But so what was it like going, and I, I know Euphoria's show you've worked at, but by the way, what could be more different than this film in Euphoria? <laughs> the insane teenage debauchery <laughs> and uh, redemption and hope. Yeah. That's range, <laughs> I, you really have range. Thank you, I appreciate it, thank you. Well, my journey in Hollywood has always been um, comedy. Like, I came out here, I studied at the Groundlings, I did sketch comedy, and I did stand-up because I wanted control of my career. And, you know, no one can tell you you can't go on a stage and do your bits, and that's, that's all you. And then, you know, being in Hollywood, auditioning, drama, comedy, drama, comedy, and then euphoria happened. And, you know, for me, it was like, okay, this was like a test for me because I didn't really think I could act. I'll be honest, I was like, I, I know I can be funny. I don't know if I can be serious. And then I had to challenge myself and say, okay, you're opposite Zendaya and Storm Reid, A-list, you know, beast actresses, and so I had to bring it. And then once I conquered that and I did it, I'm like, oh, I can do anything. Well, there is precedent. I mean, Carrot Top did do chairman of the board. <laughs> so there is one guy to successfully 
cross <laughs> over from the realm of stand-up into carrot serious top. theatrical work. You're giving work. me Carrot Top. Okay. I'm saying, what uh, about Robin Williams? Come on. Can, can I get some Jim Carrey? Oh, okay. Can I get some, I he, did I had some work. he did some theatrical work. You may be right. I'd have to, uh, I, I have to wiki him or IMDb him. Um, so... How do they even find you for this role? I mean, you when you see the film, you couldn't imagine someone else playing the role, but it seems like it's such an unlikely pairing. Do they come to you, the producers, the filmmakers? Yes, they came to my agent. I read the script. I love the script. I let my mom read the script because yeah. this is actually her story. She was brought up in foster care and eventually fostered um, by a pastor and his wife. And so once we, you know, we read it, she turned to me and she's like, this is your movie. This is it. You're going to do it. I'm like, okay, slow down. That's not how Hollywood works. By the just way, can I, I just say this script. now? You can drop the BS. You got the role. What? Okay. <laughs> no, I'm Well, whole foster child. No, Mom, Mom I'm grew serious. up in Beverly Hills. No, I wish. Married to a rich white guy. <laughs> no. Just drop it. You got the role. I grew up in you Liberty City, part. Miami Day, it. Rick Ross 305. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Demetrius, uh, you uh, absolutely amazing as the uh, the Reverend, and um, just Woo! melted in, into into that role. But again, I will don't let me put parts in your mouth. I know that sounded weird, but what I mean is, is it didn't look like any other roles that you had played when I was looking down your uh, your hit sheet. What other roles have you seen? <laughs> I read every, I read the bios on the way in. Okay. And I see all the roles that people play, and I didn't see a, a reverend. Scroll from Texas. me at scroll yeah. Google at the stoplight. Mm -hmm. um, I don't. What was your question? Uh, how did the How did the project come to you? I auditioned. That's it. Huh? A lot, like over and over again. Oh really? I basically just I knocked on the door and I was like. Hey, I really like to be in your movie. And then when I heard nothing, and then I was like, I knocked a little harder. Hey, I want to be in your movie. And then when I didn't hear anything else, then I started beep. I said, I want to be in your movie. And then eventually, that and a little bit of a, you know, law of attraction. And what what attracted you to the role? I mean, why did you have such a strong feeling about it? Just responded to the script? Yeah, the story was amazing. I mean, you actually today on the show you get to see the um, actual source uh, of our story, which is uh, Bishop and and uh, First Lady Donna Martin. Their story is a real life one. You know, we get the opportunity to hold up a mantle that their life is has created, and then, and then also the people of uh, Possum Trot, like Bennett Chapel, like the community that's responsible for adopting all these kids. Uh, Diana, uh, same question. What got? Oh, Diana, sorry. I don't know what it is. Okay. Diana, sorry. Uh, how did you get involved with this process? Um, well, I've got an agent and a manager, and they sent it over from America because I'm live in London. That's um, crazy. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't. You weren't ready for that, huh? No, it's just uh, I wasn't ready for your outfit either, though. To be honest, I was, I wasn't ready for a lot of well, stuff. Well, get ready then. <laughs> I wasn't ready for beatbox. I wasn't ready for leather. I wasn't ready. This for is pleather. Hold on, I'm vegan. No, if oh, anybody. pleasure, pleather. Yeah, Sorry. yeah, because you know the vegans, they will come after me. This is pleather. Vegan leather. <laughs> Vegan Sorry, Deanna. Uh, so, yeah, yeah, process. So, um, I got over from my manager, my agent, and then I auditioned the first time. And then they were like, they were getting what they wanted, but not exactly. Like, they wanted a little bit more to see how far I could go. So then, similar to Demetrius, I auditioned over and over, and more coaching, and then over again. Um, and then we sent in the tape to Josh, and... They loved it, so, yeah. Can you give us your ugliest American accent right now, just to all us, so we can go into a shame spiral? <laughs> um, how y'all doing? <laughs> I had an English girlfriend once, and she'd go, you want some water? I don't know why water seemed to uh, hit hardest for her. Um, so, how long was the shoot, and where was the shoot? And it seemed difficult emotionally to do the shoot. I mean, you gotta go to these 
places where, yeah, you're, you're acting, but those are tears. Um, was, it, was it a difficult shoot? It was a 25-day shoot. Really? Shot That's a Just short... over 20-something days. So I think it was uh, low end 23 for the principal photography, 25, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, we shot it uh, in Macon, movie Macon, Macon, Georgia. Wow. So we shot Georgia for Texas, and it worked out pretty good. <laughs> worked out pretty good. That's a, f you know, I, I say it all the time, but I've made a couple independent films, and, and people think the budget is about special effects or hiring A-listers, but it's really about the time. Because when you're on a budget, you have to kind of move. And sometimes you got it, and sometimes you don't got it, but we're moving on, or you think you got it and we're moving on to the next setup. And 25 days or 23 for the principal is, is a shoot where you are doing multiple, multiple setups a day. And people have to be good and people have to also know if they got it, not only the talent, but certainly the director and the people behind the scenes as well. This movie looked like a bigger budget larger, longer film, but it uh, evidently was not, so uh, kudos. It was a lightning in the bottle story, and we were fortunate that our director and our executive producer and, uh, and Josh and Rebecca, that they had been with this thing from the inception, so they were really clear about what they wanted to kind of streamline from the inception to getting it to theaters. They were pretty locked in on that, that helped. Yeah, so they lived with the story, had it emulsify, in, in, in them and they knew what they wanted as opposed to a director where somebody handed you a script a couple weeks earlier and you kind of piled through it and you didn't exactly know what you were uh, looking for. So I guess, you think this is gonna open up a lot of stand-up opportunities for you? <laughs> I don't think so. I, I, I don't think it'll open up stand-up opportunities. I think it'll just open up opportunities for people to know who I am and know my story, know where I'm from, know that my mom was actually in foster care. Again, Adam. you got the role, please. Jeez Louise. <laughs> um, and just understand that like, I've been in Hollywood for over 20 years and at the end of the day, you get a project like this and it literally changes your life. It, it, it didn't make me richer. I wasn't able to go buy the mansion and all of the stuff that you think you want when you're acting and you're, and you're going after certain projects. But this gave me purpose. This aligned me with the things that I want to do for my life. And now I understand that my whole platform, everything I do now is different. Like with Euphoria, it was great. Euphoria basically put me on a level where people saw me as a legit dramatic actress. That established that for me but it didn't give me purpose. I still had void. I still was searching and trying to figure out my way. And then, you know, as you know, we take forever to shoot seasons. So in between not working, when I get the call and I get this script and I meet with Joshua and Rebecca on a Zoom and they loved me and then I don't hear anything from them. And I'm like, okay, well, I guess I didn't get that movie. And that's kind of like normal for actors. And then they come back and tell me, okay, we like you, but we want to give you the sister role. We want you to play the sister. Now, you know, I'm A-list, well, A-minus, B-plus. But I said, okay, I'll take the sister role. I'm, I'm obedient because I want to be a part of this story. And then between me jumping on a flight from LA to Macon, it changed. And as soon as I landed, for whatever reason, God said, no, you're the lead of this film, and you've been the lead, and things had to shift, but I'm, I'm gonna put you in position to do this role and to do it right. Yeah. And just for clarity, because I was watching TMZ about three and a half months ago, <laughs> and they filmed you doing stand-up, saying you didn't have any money because Euphoria had been off the air and we didn't know when Zendaya was coming back from tennis camp and you were doing a comedy That's bit. a way better tagline than, than Paris, <laughs> I'll take you. it. Um, but I was sitting there watching it and they were taking it literally. Like she's out of money because Zendaya won't come back from you know, the, the, the runway. And I was like, she's doing a joke, she's making a comedy joke, but you can set 
you can set the record straight tonight. Well, the record is I'm still broke, and um. Yeah, but you you. Hello, you, did you did you just not hear anything I said? You got three grand no. worth of pleather <laughs> on you, please. This is not How three can grand. It's broke. Twenty five hundred. Um. <laughs> well, with tax and shipping. <laughs> But no, it's, it was a joke. I do stand up. That's what I love to do. I, I, I'm always talking about my life, and that's what I did. I just talked about my life, but I made it into a bit, and it, it got out of hand. But guess what? It kind of helped me in a way because now people see that I'm actually a stand up. You see how God works? God, God, God don't make no mistakes. Everything happens within his time, and what people think is done for bad will always be used for good. So All things work Y'all go on NikaKing.com yeah, when I'm coming to your city to do some stand up. <laughs> you say God doesn't make mistakes, but I got a couple family members. <laughs> I mean, it may not be. Let's just keep moving. Let's just keep moving on. Uh, so, Demetrius, you are, are, is everyone out here, L.A. bound, or are you going back and forth from going, uh, back and forth and, uh, like, uh, up and down, too. I'm, I'm on the East Coast in D.C., but uh, currently I'm in New Orleans, and time to time I'm in L.A., so that's What's New life. Orleans like to live? You live in New Orleans? Uh, I'm there for a little while right now. Are you filming something? No, just living. Sounds like you're up to something. <laughs> I feel like a cop would just pull them over. What are you doing? I'm, in I'm working on several uh, multinational businesses that will be hubbed around the Gulf Coast dealing with maternal health care. So you're working on something in New Orleans, but not ready to. Yeah, I mean, put I think it, it would be right in, now. inappropriate. It's, it's, but, you know, I don't want to skew the focus. Can you live? I've been told by people you can visit New Orleans, but you can't really live there. No, you cannot live uh, around the year eating fried poor boys and drinking daiquiris. You will quickly go into a diabetic coma. Right, but you can live on the outskirts yeah. yes. there. That's, yeah. that's a fair deduction. And uh, I guess we should, uh, I mean, it is for what we can talk about. Uh, so it was about a 25-day shoot. Yeah. You guys shot it. How long is it? been since it was shot? Literally about a year, a year and a, a month. And then there's, w once you get a big, wonderful partner like Angel, there's all this little like post-production stuff that happens where you have to jump back into the character. Yeah. Because then, you know, key art has to happen and photography and promo stuff to, to really package the filming and get it out to the audience in its best way. So that's been fun to like regrow the mutton chops and try to color in a handlebar mustache to become the reverend again, even if it's just for still photography. That's been pretty fascinating. Yeah, I made a boxing movie once, and I was dieting all through the movie because it was a boxing movie. And then the movie ended, and I said, now it's time to go to Golden Corral. And then a month later, they're like, we need pickups. Exactly. And I'm like, well, I picked up about 18 pounds. <laughs> it's all in my head. So I don't know how this one's going to work out. Yeah. You, 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 you know, it, some of this is, is got to remember, it's art. So you're, you are throwing paint against a canvas to a certain degree, you know, and seeing, and seeing what, what goes together well. And uh, Deanna, what, what do we have as far as projects, plans? I mean, your age is four, how four? 15. 15. Oh, so you're just looking forward to the 10th grade? Or, or grade 10, or whatever you call it. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm, I think here would be grade 9, I think. I just turned 15. Oh, you just turned yeah. 15. Oh, so you're looking forward to a, a learner's permit and a date yeah. to the prom? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Exams and stuff. Not All necessarily in that order, but uh, yeah. It's, but are you out or back and, and forth, or are you in L.A.? So I came to, I just recently came to L.A. to do, like, press and, Mm -hmm. Watch a movie for the first time and everything for that, but I'm going back to London soon. And well, what was it? What was it like? Because you do when you you're in a film, you haven't necessarily seen the film, even though you've lived the film. But it's you never until it's assembled and the music and the mixture. I mean, just the mix and the music add so much to to a film. And 
a lot of people will go like, I don't want you watching this rough cut. And they'll go, oh, I, I'm a big boy, I can understand, you gotta put the music in. And it's like, no, you won't like it, or the sound or, or the sound mix, or whatever it is. So you guys do it, and then a year goes by, and you are also not seeing it from the perspective of the lens, and then you see the finished product. What was that experience like in no particular order? Well, Deanna saw it for the first time last yeah. night. Mm. Yeah, I did. Because I made my family. So they sent us over a link so then we can watch it back home in London, just like rough cut-ish. But I didn't want to wa watch it in the rough cut. I wanted to have that big moment where I saw it. So I made sure to delete it off of everyone, el else, everyone else's phone. Cause, but my mum, she kept it on her phone and she watched 15 minutes of it. So I had to ban her phone for a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have that power. Anyway, um, yes, we, I didn't let them all watch it until yesterday night. But I literally couldn't even watch the movie because like half the movie, I was just crying and crying and crying. Because it was so long ago. That I didn't even remember how the whole thing would look like. It was just amazing. And I had a very similar story because like, Last night was the first time I watched the movie in its totality because I promised my son, he was there when we shot it in the church. And so I promised him that I'd only watch it in totality with him. So the first time we were at the uh, other theater, I had to keep running in and out of the theater to try to keep my word. They're here tonight too, my boys. That's, uh, it's probably the way to watch a film. I mean, everyone wants to see the rough cuts or the dailies or whatever, whatever it is, but the finished product is probably the way to do it. I've, I've seen it. I want to see the rough cut. I'm, I'm told, I'm very, I'm very particular about certain things and because I was an executive producer and because I wore a lot of wigs in this film, I said, I need to see the rough cuts. I need to see what's going on, how it looks. It cannot be a Tyler Perry production. Send me the rough cuts. I gotta see it, I'm sorry, I'm being transparent here. It's 100%, like, this is my first feature film, my first executive producer credit. I was very nervous and so, Josh, at first, he did not want me to see the film because as you heard, there's a voiceover component. So when we submitted to Angel, we didn't have the voiceover done. He was like, oh, we'll do the voiceover later. And I'm like, okay. And then later was like two months, three, it was like a year later. And I'm like, well, now I have to kind of reimagine this dialect and, and then try to get back into First Lady. And it was, it was difficult, I, I'm gonna admit, because it, it, when you're in a, in production, you're in it, right? You're, you're like, every day you're waking up and you're breathing this character, and when you've gone on and you rapped, now you have to come back to it. And so the first rough cut was me doing voiceover in my closet with a coat over my head, mm. and I'm like trying to like sound like First Lady Donna Martin, what I remembered, and that was enough to get us um, in the guild and get us voted to go to the next step, and then I had to go back into um, uh, to do the official voiceover, and that's what you hear in the movie. So I was I was involved from like rough cut all the way to um, to the end, and and I think there were changes. Josh, I think he changed the la the song again. So it's been it's been some changes, like and all of them I think were great because it it kind of it kind of molded the film a little differently every time, and it 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 made you realize, oh, this is getting it gets better. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Demetrius, you sunk into the Reverend role pretty pretty well, and got right out of the gate with it, and it it seemed pretty organic to me. Um, did you grow up in a church? Do you have a connection to that character, that role? Did you have to hang out with the uh, with the Reverend and and work that one, with the Bishop, and work that one out, or how did that? Or it just come naturally to you? Yeah, well, all of the above, actually. And I just taped a Bible to my belly during the speeches. <laughs> <laughs> so you grew up around that? A little bit, yeah. I grew up, uh, but I grew up in all kinds of religions, honestly. I grew up in, uh, I guess, Baptist to start. Uh, did a little uh, Hebrew school through middle school and a Jewish day school. Uh, after Jewish day school, I went to a Catholic high school. During that time, I uh, learned about Rastafari, and uh, also around that time, there was an English translation of the Quran, so I had some mentors who were Muslims, so spirituality's kind of always been around me. Um, I don't lean to the far right or to the far left, though. 
And have you, so I guess this role then, because of your sort of unique background, definitely, definitely yeah, spoke it to was, you. It was powerful to be able to conduct the energy that I saw in my grandmother's church, for sure. The Baptist, the Baptist background, um, the Pentecostal preacher kind of vibe. I mean, it's, it's nostalgic for me. And uh, it has a, a novelty to it because of the rhythm that um, that bishop speaks in, and, and that's a that's a culture that is so familiar to so many of us. And what do you what do you hope the film does in terms of not box office, although you know that's always nice. And you know I think people think you're rooting for money, but when you're rooting for box office, you're really rooting to just make the next film. It's the money's great, but if it gasses out completely, makes the next project that much more difficult to make. So you're rooting for box office, but it's not just chasing a dollar. It's basically saying this will propel us into the next, the next project and the one after that. I hope this film creates rooms where everybody's looking down the pew and having the same experience and the demographics are all over the charts. Uh, whether you're LGBTQ+, plus, whether you're black, whether you're white, whether you're Latino, whether you're Asian, whether you're Pentecostal, or whether you're uh, Jewish, or whether you're whatever you are, all these little things that we separate ourselves in on a daily basis, I hope that people see the power of unity and faith to get these kids homes, regardless. <laughs> And box office number one. I mean, on top of that, little on cherry, top of that. that little cherry, little cherry. On top, little cherry on top. Yeah, and I um, maybe I should have asked uh, the guests who are on stage previously, but I, I imagine the idea is to show this in churches, right? To get it out and have it shown in that that venue. I mean, that's that's the audience you're trying to get it to. I mean, in terms of the message, and it's also a you know, a built-in audience. So I would imagine there's some plan to push it out into that that community. And I think, uh, as I discussed previously, I, I think I think the time is right. Like I feel like the nation has sort of hit its saturation level with a lot of what's going on, and a good message and a message of hope and a powerful message is something we're looking, we're ready to accept. And, you know, I don't, I'm from North Hollywood and I'm an atheist, so I don't have any church in me and I don't have any background like this uh, in me as well. But obviously the message is powerful and it transcends a religious message. And also maybe we're coming to a time when we stop sort of breaking everyone down by their ethnicity or the color of skin or whatever. Um, because this is essentially a, a white couple making a black film with a universal message, right? And in the past, like if this went through Hollywood, they would say, we love the story, but we can't have a couple of white folk doing a black, not necessarily. A black story. Not I had it happen to me, but I'll, get, I'll tell you in a second. Not necessarily. I've, uh, I've in seen, the past, in I'm the, saying. Well, I've seen, I've seen a white executive producers do black stories. That's actually very common. But it's, it's tied to a white savior um, complex in most of those stories. This is not a white savior complex movie. This is not, and, and I like that you said it's a black film with a universal theme. But see, that's the issue right there. We have to remove this, this idea of black and white. We're talking about children, period. And we're not talking about black children, because if you, if, if you know the system, you know that all kids are in the system, black, white, Hispanic, biracial, um, um, mentally challenged, mentally disabled. Like, 
there is no color when, you, when you're talking about these kids. So I, I totally understand what you're saying. And, and listen, pe that's a real thing. People are like, why are these white people making this black story? But guess what? These white people are God's people. So it's not about the color. It's about them having the vision and saying, this story needs to be told. I'm going to move my family down to Possum Trot and become a part of this community, a part of this church, to make sure that we get this right. And they got it right. And here we are right now having a July 4th release nationwide in over 2,000 theaters. If you don't believe in God, then guess what, baby? I don't know what to tell you. Well, I don't think we're going to do better than that. <laughs> Sound of Hope is the name of the film. Thank you guys for coming out today and uh, being a part of this. And you got to share the good news, I think, as they, as, they, as they say. So just get out and share the good news. Demetrius and Nika and Deanna, thank you guys so much for coming out. Thank you for having us. Tonight. And God bless.